Hi, I'm Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. In this series of videos, I'm going to be addressing the anti-word of faith videos of Reformed apologist Justin Peters. Justin has pretty much made a career of attacking the word of faith movement. While he also discusses Catholicism and other issues from time to time, there's no question that his ministry has largely been built on his attacks of the Word of Faith movement, its theology, and the people teaching it. Unfortunately, he has a history of misrepresenting people in his unbridled passion for the defense of the Reformed, Calvinist, and Cessationist view. A good example of this can be seen in this clip of Bill Johnson, the pastor of Bethel Church in Redding, California. This from Bill Johnson. I don't know, did you know that Jesus was born again? Did you know that Jesus was born again? See, they teach that Jesus died spiritually in hell, ceased to be God, and had to be born again. He had to get saved. In fact, Bill Johnson doesn't believe that Jesus was born again in hell but that his resurrection was a rebirth, which is perfectly biblical. Today I have begotten you. The second psalm. You're my beloved son. Today I have begotten you. Acts 13 tells us that that phrase from the Father, today I have begotten you, is in reference to the resurrection. So he was born through Mary, the virgin, and then he was born again in resurrection. As we will see in this series of videos, this is a very common tactic with Justin Peters. Let's begin with Justin's version of the origins of Word of Faith theology. Untruth number one, the Word of Faith movement began with Phineas Quimby. So where did the Word of Faith movement begin? Well, it began with a man named Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. Quimby was the father of New Thought, a metaphysical cult. Now, I came into the Word of Faith movement around 1980. I've spent two years at Kenneth Hagin's Rhema Bible Training Center, and I've attended numerous seminars and conventions over the years, as well as attending Word of Faith churches on a regular basis. I never even heard of Quimby before I saw Justin Peters' video. After researching the guy, I could understand why I'd never heard of him. Nobody in the Word of Faith movement ever mentions him because he's not relevant. And the only time I've heard the name Mary Baker Eddy, who founded the Church of Christian Science, was when the speaker was drawing a clear distinction between, between what she taught and what is taught in the Word of Faith. There is absolutely no theological link from Quimby to the Word of Faith. This is all based on allegations that Dan McConnell made in his book, A Different Gospel, when he asserted, with zero evidence, that E.W. Kenyon took his teachings from New Thought during his two semesters at Emerson College in Boston. As we will cover later, Kenyon opposed New Thought. Untruth number two. Kenyon is recognized by all modern prosperity preachers as the grandfather of the Word of Faith movement. Essek W. Kenyon is the grandfather of the Word of Faith movement. Uh, Kenyon is recognized by all your modern prosperity preachers as uh, the grandfather of this movement. They would all appeal to Kenyon. First of all, the movement is the Word of Faith movement, not the prosperity movement. That's a derogatory name given by the opponents, based on the overemphasis on financial prosperity from some within and outside of the movement. While Kenyon's writings were popularized by Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, and others, I've never heard anybody within the movement refer to Kenyon as the grandfather of the movement. Brother Hagin also popularized the writings of Smith Wigglesworth and F.F. F. Bosworth, but nobody ever claimed that either of those gentlemen is the grandfather of the movement because they never lived in Boston like Kenyon did, and they came from a Pentecostal background, which is too mainstream for Word of Faith critics. Untruth number three. Kenyon had very clear ties to New Age and New Thought. 
Kenyon himself had very clear ties to the metaphysical cults, particularly New Age and New Thought. First of all, the New Age movement began 20 years after Kenyon died, so it'd be kind of hard for him to have ties to a movement that started 20 years after he passed away. Now, there was a movement in the 19th century called Theosophy, which was similar to New Age. But Kenyon was opposed to Theosophy, and he stated so in his book, The Father and His Family. In fact, Kenyon was also opposed to New Thought, and made that quite clear in his writings. Rather than becoming a minister with any New Thought-related church like Unity or Christian Science, Kenyon became an ordained Free Will Baptist minister after leaving Emerson. This is all well documented in Joe McIntyre's book, E.W. Kenyon and His Message of Faith, The True Story. Untruth number four. Kenyon taught that God didn't create ex nihilo, out of nothing, but by speaking faith-filled words. Kenyon taught that God created not ex nihilo, as we call it, not out of nothing, but rather God created by speaking faith-filled words. Now, while it's true that Kenyon believed, as most people do if they've read the Bible, that God spoke the worlds into existence, Hebrews 11.3, it is not true that Kenyon denied the doctrine of creatio ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. The two concepts aren't mutually exclusive. Untruth number five, Kenyon taught that man lost his deity in the fall. Kenyon held that humans took on the nature of Satan in the fall. When this happened, they forfeited to Satan their supposed deity and made Satan the legal god of planet Earth. Justin's own bullet text states it correctly, even though he can't bring himself to do so. Divine dominion doesn't mean deity. It means that man's dominion on earth was divinely granted when God told him to have dominion on the earth. This is just in the first four minutes of the first video, folks. I've still got over an hour to go, but you get the idea. Justin Peters doesn't know what he's talking about. He has more interest in bashing the Word of Faith movement than he does in seeking and speaking the truth. Untruth number six. Benny Hinn is a modern Word of Faith minister. Kenyon did hold to many of the fundamental doctrines of Orthodox Christianity. However, what's happened in the modern Word of Faith movement is that your modern prosperity preachers like Benny Hinn and Kenneth Copeland have taken Kenyon's mistakes and made them much worse. If Justin Peters believes that Benny Hinn is a Word of Faith minister, then Justin Peters doesn't know what the Word of Faith is. So why is he going all around the world presenting himself as an expert on something he doesn't know much about? Hinn renounced Word of Faith theology in a 1993 interview with Charisma magazine, the third largest uh, Christian magazine in publication. He said that he was returning to his earlier influences from Catholicism and Catherine Kuhlman. You can see the change occurring just by looking at how he dressed. In the 1980s, he wore a jacket and tie. After he renounced the Word of Faith, he started wearing this collared frock-looking thing. He hasn't been Word of Faith for 24 years, and it's dishonest for Word of Faith critics like Justin Peters to claim that he is. Untruth number seven, William Branham taught false doctrine. And finally, Branham taught that the doctrine of the Trinity was a demonic doctrine. Listen to the following audio clip of William Branham and then listen to Benny Hinn's endorsement of him. Now, my precious brother, I know this is a tape also. Now, don't get excited. Let me say this with godly love. The hours approach where I can't hold still on these things no more. It's too close yeah, to the man. see? Trinitarianism is of the devil. I say that, thus saith the Lord. God uses normal individuals. Whether it's Smith Wigglesworth or Catherine Kuhlman or Amy or A. Allen or William Branham. Great men of God. Okay, this is actually more of a half-truth, but it's still misleading. 
This audio clip is from 1961. Yes, William Branham taught those things in the late 1950s until he died in 1965. But when he was in the prime of his healing and prophetic ministries in the late 1940s and early 1950s, he didn't focus on doctrine. He only began to teach these aberrant doctrines after coming under the influence of the United Pentecostal Church. The story of Branham is told in Frida Lindsay's book, My Diary Secrets. Gordon Lindsay and Kenneth Hagin were well aware of the error that Branham was teaching, and Brother Lindsay tried to talk some sense into him, but he wouldn't listen. Kenneth Hagin told us about Branham's error while I was at Rama. It's unfortunate that he got off into error at the end, but the error of his later years has nothing to do with the word of faith. And again, Benny Hinn is not word of faith. Untruth number eight. Kenneth Hagin claimed that no believer should die before age 120. Uh, though Kenneth Hagin claimed that no believer should die before age 120, you see that he died here at age 86. Fred Price said something like that in his book, Is Healing for All, but I never heard or read where Kenneth Hagin said that. For many years, he said that he would live to be 70 or 80 years old, and once he reached 80, he started talking about going for 120. I think he based that on something Finest Jennings Dake wrote about the 120 years in Genesis 6-3, not referring to the flood, but to the maximum number of years that we can live. I didn't agree with it, but there are several things I disagreed with Kenneth Hagin on, and of course, he wasn't perfect. The bottom line here is that there's no evidence that I can see that Kenneth Hagin ever stated what Justin Peters claimed he said. Telling people he's shooting for 120 isn't the same as saying that nobody should die before 120. Untruth number nine. Faith people like Kenneth Hagin say, if you can't find it in the word, don't worry about it because I have it from the highest authority. Uh, Kenneth Hagin, like almost all of the Word of Faith preachers claim that much of what they teach you they receive directly from divine revelation knowledge from Jesus himself. And this is almost like their fallback position and their way of insulating themselves from any biblical criticism. And they'll say essentially that, well, if you can't find what I'm teaching you in the Word, don't worry about it, you see, because I have it from the highest authority, Jesus himself. Hogwash. Kenneth Hagin was a stickler for the Word of God. He said countless times that if somebody prophesies over you or shares a revelation with you that isn't supported by scripture, forget it. In his book, I Believe in Visions, he said, the Holy Spirit always leads us in line with the Word. The Word and the Spirit agree. I am not in favor of following voices, for a person can go wrong following voices, but we can never go wrong following any voice that leads us to walk in line with the Word of God. In Seven Steps to Judging Prophecy, he said, The Holy Spirit is not going to tell you one thing in the Word and another thing through prophecy. If a prophecy doesn't agree with the Word of God, it isn't right. If it's the same Spirit, it's going to agree with the Word. In Exceedingly Growing Faith, he had a vision, and he spoke to the Lord and said, But Lord, you're going to have to give me some scripture to prove it. Your word says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established, Matthew 18, 16. So give me some more scripture having these same four principles in it, and I will believe it. I would not accept any vision, even if I did see you, if you could not prove what you said by the Bible. Justin Peters will not be able to produce one audio or video to prove what he said. He's either misinformed or he's lying. Untruth number 10. Kenneth Hagin claimed to have received these words from Jesus. But Hagin claimed that he received these words directly from Jesus himself. It's interesting, however, that Jesus bears a striking resemblance to Essek W. Kenyon. If you can see here, it's practically word for word identical. Wrong. Kenneth Hagin didn't claim to receive those words from Jesus. He quoted Kenyon a lot, but he never claimed to have received those words from God when he quoted Kenyon. And he didn't plagiarize Kenyon. Kenneth Hagin wrote very few books. Most of his books and magazine articles 
were taken from sermons he preached. This excerpt from a transcript of one of Kenneth Hagin's messages where he quoted Kenyon was published in a free monthly publication of Kenneth Hagin Ministries called The Word of Faith. The copy editor didn't recognize that he was quoting Kenyon and failed to publish an acknowledgment. It was an unfortunate oversight and nothing more. If Kenneth Hagin had been trying to steal Kenyon's words, he wouldn't have gone to such great lengths to acknowledge Kenyon like he did in his 1979 book, The Name of Jesus. I quote, In the Name of Jesus seminar I conducted in April 1978, I quoted freely from E.W. Kenyon's book, The Wonderful Name of Jesus. I particularly like the way he grouped the scriptures for study. I like his outline. I acknowledge here my deep appreciation for the revelation knowledge God gave him on this wonderful name, for his willingness and obedience to teach and live it. I also want to express special appreciation to Ruth Howsworth, that's Kenyon's daughter, for her dedication in getting the message out in print, and for granting us permission to quote from his book in this book for the edification of the body of Christ to the glory of God the Father. This was nine years before Dan McConnell wrote his book accusing Kenneth Hagin of plagiarizing Kenyon. The issue of plagiarism is addressed on the Kenyan Gospel Publishing Society's website, and they basically say that it's a great big nothing burger. Untruth number 11. Kenyon believed that the metaphysical cults had tapped into some power. Dealing with occultic origins, Kenyon writes, we cannot ignore the amazing growth of Christian science, unity, new thought, spiritism. We cannot close our eyes to the fact that in many of our cities on the Pacific Coast, Mrs. Eddy has a stronger following today and a larger attendance at her churches than have the old line denominations. The people have left them because they believe they are receiving more help from Mrs. Eddy's teaching than from preachers. They will tell you how they were healed and how they were helped in their spiritual life by this strange cult. So, by his own admission, Kenyon believed that these metaphysical cults had really tapped into some power. That is not what he said. He said that the people believe that they were helped. And again, he didn't teach their cultic doctrines. He opposed them, as you can see in his writings. J.P.'s own quote shows you that Kenyon considered Christian science a cult. But here's what J.P. left out of the Kenyon quote. This is a libel upon the modern church. It is not only a libel, but a challenge. We have lost the supernatural element out of Christianity, and we are clinging with trembling hands to a historical Christ that has no power to heal the sick and no ability to meet your daily needs. The spirit of real evangelism is almost a thing of the past. We have driven the miracle-working Christ out of the church. Now we are driving the believers in miracles out of the church. We cannot blame the missions and nonconformist cults that are rising everywhere. It is a protest of the people against the modern theological thought that dominates the church. Christian science could not have grown to the place where it is dominating many of our large cities unless there had been a demand in the heart of the people for a supernatural religion. The Pentecostal movement could not have risen with the power that it has had not the heart of the people been craving a new, fresh vision of Christ. A dead orthodoxy has no resurrection power within it, no miracle-working force back of it. The people are putting up with extravagances and fanaticism in order that they may get a little touch of the supernatural God. Cultured men and women will listen to uneducated preachers because, of, because the uneducated preacher in the dingy mission has faith in a living God. When men tell us that we do not need miracles today, that education will take their place, they have not th thought through on this subject. No man can actually live and walk with the man of Galilee without living in the realm of the miraculous. Jesus is as much a miracle now as ever. Man needs his miraculous touch now more than ever. Nothing but a return to this God of miracles will save our land and nation. 
So we can see from the whole quote that Kenyon wasn't trying to tap into the power of the metaphysical cults. He was just saying that people are leaving the formalistic Christian churches in droves and seeking the miraculous in New Thought and Pentecostal congregations. Funny how the critics don't accuse Kenyon of trying to tap into the Pentecostal power, huh? No, Kenyon wasn't trying to tap into anything but the same miraculous power that Jesus and the apostles demonstrated when they walked on the earth, and he saw faith in God's word as the means to bring it about. Next, Justin Peters plays a clip of Gloria Copeland talking about speaking to storms. If it is true, and that's a huge if, but if it is true that Gloria Copeland can control the weather by the words that she speaks, then I would submit to you that Gloria Copeland is one of the most wretched people alive on the face of the earth today. Might we ask where she was when a little storm named Hurricane Katrina rolled into town? Here, he shows a failure to grasp the implications of his own logic. Were there any people who died in storms during Jesus' time on earth? Of course. Why didn't he do something to save them? Why didn't Jesus keep Pilate from killing the Galilean worshippers or prevent the Tower of Siloam from falling and killing 18 men? He could have. Well, if he had the power to stop storms and prevent tragedies and didn't do it, that would make him a terrible person by Justin's logic. The truth is, Jesus only rebuked storms when it posed a threat to him and his disciples. The Apostle Paul didn't go looking for snakes. But when one threatened his life, he just shook it off. After that, Justin Peters claims that Kenneth Hagin said that Adam was another Yahweh. And according to Kenneth Hagin, Adam could stand toe-to-toe with God and have no consciousness of inferiority whatsoever. Adam was another Yahweh. Kenneth Hagin didn't say that Adam was another Yahweh. He said that God made Adam as much like himself as possible, referring to the spiritual nature of man who was created in God's image as a spiritual being, while lacking his attributes. In his book, Zoe, The God Kind of Life, Kenneth Hagin said, God made man his understudy. He made him king to rule over everything that had life. Man was master. Now, How could man be Yahweh and God's understudy at the same time? Yes, man was given dominion over the earth, but that doesn't mean that he was God. He didn't say that they weren't inferior. He said that they were without consciousness of inferiority, which was a reference to Adam and Eve prior to the fall. They didn't run and hide from God like they did after the fall. So, no. Kenneth Hagin didn't say that Adam was another Yahweh. Justin Peters doesn't know what he's talking about. Next, J.P. says that the Word of Faith teaches that when you're born again, you get your deity back. Well, guess what happens when a person gets saved? According to faith theology, guess what he gets back? Oh, he gets his godhood back. He becomes deity again. He becomes... God again just like Adam was before he fell and this dear friends is why the faith preachers hold so tenaciously to health and wealth because we're gods during my two years at Rama, I never heard anything like this being taught Kenneth Hagin taught that believers have been made partakers of the divine nature 2 Peter 1 4 but he didn't say that we are gods or become gods when we're saved now unfortunately Others in the Word of Faith have chosen the term little gods to describe believers. But even then, they didn't mean it the way that Word of Faith critics are saying. Word of Faith theology does teach that believers share in the authority delivered to Jesus when he overcame Satan and death. When he appeared to his disciples, he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 18, 19. Jesus commissioned the church to go with his authority and his name. Mark 16, 17. That's what we get when we're born again. 
authority, not deity. And we don't believe in health and wealth because we're gods. We believe in healing and prosperity because they're in the Bible. 